Welcome to Rare On Air, the monthly podcast from Eurodis, Rare Diseases Europe. I am your host, Julian Poulan, and once a month, we will be exploring the challenges, experiences, and successes of people who live with a rare condition. In today's episode, I am joined by Dominic Sturz, who is the leader of the Usher Initiative Austria, an expert advocate for people living with a rare condition, and the mother of someone who lives with Usher syndrome. Dominic shares with us her family's experience of a lack of available treatments, and she details how she believes Europe should go much further to ensure treatments are discovered and developed for people with a rare condition. I am also joined by Simone Baselli, who explains the EU's newly launched efforts to boost the development of and access to rare disease medicines and the promise these efforts hold. Simone and Dominic, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you for having me in this conversation. I'd like to begin today's discussion by getting to the basics of orphan medicines. And my first question I'd actually like to put to Simone. Simone, what exactly are orphan medicines? The term orphan was introduced in the European legislation in 2000, but already existed in the US jurisdiction from the early 80s. And it basically referred to medicines that, that treat very rare conditions. In uh, the European Union, those orphan medicinal therapeutic medicine products are those targeting a disease which has a prevalence of no more than five in ten in ten thousands which is a similar prevalence also in the us but there the target is around the maximum population of 200,000 patients in the country but essentially they target areas with very scarce knowledge very low interest in developing uh, therapies because of a number of intrinsic issues to that people with living with a rare disease know very well. The lack of information, the lack of studies, the lack of knowledge, the scarcity, and the often disconnection between a medical practitioner and also the lack of investment from the pharmaceutical sector in those areas. So in a nutshell, those this is what uh, epitomized the orphan medicinal products and and if I may add, of course, the regulation that was introduced in Europe in the year 2000 had filled in a gap in the market and also underlined an equity principle by indicating that people living with a rare disease do deserve the same quality treatment as those living with more common conditions. So what measures were included in the OMP regulation? Um, Of course, OMP stands for Orphan Medicinal Products. What measures did the OMP regulation introduce in 2000 in the EU to incentivize orphan medicines development? And have these measures been successful over the past more than two decades? Uh, Historically, um, some of the uh, main feature of the orphan medicinal product uh, collated around the needs specific to the people living with rare diseases and the specific uh, rare diseases themselves. So basically, they incentivize the development and research for research and developing in those areas by providing um, an orphan designation that a time of marketing authorization would translate into a protection and market protection in the form of a market exclusivity that would protect the authorized medicine for a period of time. In this year, in this case, it was decided to be 10 years. Uh, One fun fact was fun, if you want to use that word, is at the time of uh, the approval of the regulation, it was uh, thought that approximately 10 years was the time to reach the entire market and therefore recover the money invested in the development of the therapies. But The market exclusivity is not the only incentives that was foreseen at the time. There was also the possibility to access scientific advice, protocol assistance for the developers. The another novel feature of the orphan medicinal product regulation was the introduction for the very first time of patients in the committee providing advice to the Committee for Human Medicinal Product for the final authorization, thus creating already a space in itself for the patient in that case. Third more, having an orphan designation would have would help in accessing research funding from the European Commission in order to allow for the financial support that was needed to bring those therapy from bench to bedside. Now, one of those features, so the market exclusivity, was unfortunately applied to a market that was not unified and still is not unified. And unfortunately, this has not translated into the greater accessibility 
of therapies. One of the key success that we've seen now after 20 years is effectively fostering the investment in and development of rare disease therapies in the European Union. This has created over 200 new therapies targeting over 170 different designations up to the beginning of uh, this year. However, the problems related to accessibility are not necessarily an intrinsic challenge of the regulation, but of how the European health system are structured and therefore they relate and they have the member states have ownership on the processes of pricing and reimbursement which lead to the accessibility the fact that the product is available in europe does not necessarily mean that is accessible to patients and therefore we still have a lot to work on to one direct investment to develop more therapies for more diseases but also to develop better therapies than the current existing one. One of the other features of the Orphan Medicinal Project Regulation is the existing of a significant benefit concept, which was introduced to ensure that the therapies that were provided for people living with rare diseases did effectively give a significant advancement in the care for them. And this is going to be continued in uh, the proposal for the new regulation. The shortcomings that we see is that uh, still we don't have enough therapies in the very ultra rare dis disorders. Most of the therapies have been concentrated in certain areas, particularly the onchomatology and the metabolic disorders, which in a sense do follow the science, where the science is, and also the number of patients. And I would say that since I joined Eurodis in 2017, we have seen a, a leap in a quantum leap in scientific knowledge, and we see more therapies that are truly transformative since then. But even before, we have had examples of truly life-changing therapies being brought to market thanks to the Orphan Medicinal Product Regulation. Great. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you, Simone. So, of course, you've touched on the areas where the regulation has been successful over the years and allowed for transformative medicines, life-changing medicines. But, of course, you've also sort of touched on a number of shortcomings from the regulations, like you say, a sort of an over-concentration of medicines for certain disease areas and a sort of fractured market. It's at this point that I'd actually like to bring in Dominique into the conversation so that we can come to understand the importance of orphan medicinal products and the regulations around encouraging rare disease medicines development and access to them. Dominique, first of all, I understand your daughter, now an adult, has Usher syndrome subtype 1. Going back to the beginning, how and when did you first learn that your child had Usher syndrome subtype type 1? USH1, as I believe it's abbreviated to, when did you learn that they may have required some sort of treatment or medical support? So yes, as you've said, I'm a parent to a young adult with a rare disease called Usher syndrome. Maybe let me start with describing the condition and the symptoms, and then I go a little bit more into how and when we learned that my child would have Usher syndrome. It's a rare genetic disorder causing cell death in the inner ear, in some Usher types, also in the vestibular system, and last but not least in the photo receptor cells, which are responsible for vision. So the consequence of all this is congenital deafness or progressive hearing loss, depending on the subtype, but also leading to deafness later. And this all, all this is combined with progressive vision loss leading to blindness. And the Usher subtype in my family is Usher syndrome 1B, which is the most severe subtype and is characterized by congenital deafness, a moderate to severe balance disorder, and very early onset retinitis pigmentosa, the eye condition, manifesting its first symptoms like night blindness, visual field uh, constriction in very young children at the age of two, three, around five years. So all the table states in the first decade of life, but experience has shown that some, in most cases it's much earlier. So and um, how and when did we learn that our child had Usher syndrome? Well, the diagnostic pathway in my family was very different from how it looks today. And it started in the late 90s. 1990s, and she was diagnosed with bilateral profound hearing loss, which is equal to deafness, when she was one year, because there was no standard of newborn hearing screening at that time. And without knowing the cause, because at those times nobody was interested in knowing the cause, except myself, of course, but I didn't get any answer, got her first cochlear implant at the age of 18 months, and her second one when she was almost three years. And while she has caught up with all the hearing and speech development and has been raised 
in an audio environment. And this, but despite what was very interesting in this pathway is that despite the obvious vestibular dysfunction with delayed motor development, and despite the early onset night blindness and the beginning visual field uh, restrictions, the retinitis pigmentosa, the eye condition, was diagnosed for the first time at nine years only when she was nine. And it was only a presumed, it was only a clinical diagnosis that got genetically confirmed when she was already 16, and that was in 2012. So, and prior to that genetic diagnosis, I had networked with the retina in the ASHA patient organizations, with clinicians, scientists, and researchers in Europe and beyond, and brought back the acquired knowledge and started advocating for early diagnosis of ASHA syndrome, which now is quite well implemented, not perfectly, but quite well. That's really interesting, and it shows just how far lots of people and families dealing with a rare condition have to go to, to get the support or diagnoses that are needed. So with regard to medications and treatments, throughout the course of your daughter's life, have sufficient medications and treatments existed for this condition? There is a way to rehabilitate one of the senses that gets lost in this disease. And this is the function of the inner ear that can be replaced or let's say rehabilitated by the medical device, the cochlear implant, which nowadays is a standard of care in most European countries after detection of profound hearing loss in the newborn hearing screening mentioned before. But there is no treatment for the vestibular dysfunction, except some physical exercise to compensate a little bit and to train the balance in those children. And above all, is there is no treatment or therapy at all for the progressive vision loss leading to blindness. There is one inherited retinal disease. Usher syndrome is a syndromic form of an inherited retinal disease. And there is one mutation, the RP65 mutation. It's a disease called LC8. There is just this one disease where there is an approved treatment, a gene therapy product that is available in many, but not all countries, and is still under negotiation in many countries for reimbursement. Um, and there is just this one for this one mutation out of 300 approximately that are responsible for inherited retinal diseases such as Usher syndrome. Yeah, so you've highlighted already some areas where, of course, increased availability of medicines can make a big difference in many people's lives. With regard to USH1, are you familiar with any scientific advancements or treatments that promise to help people living with the condition, given that there are these areas where more approvals and uh, expanded availability would clearly do a lot of good? Interestingly, we have seen decades of research in the Asha and in the wider retina space for the eye condition. There are are innovative therapy options in clinical trials or close to clinical trials. Most of them are gene therapy options. There are around 40 gene therapy trials trials ongoing for various mutations causing such inherited retinal diseases. There are also some cell treatments in trials and there are some gene therapies for Usher syndrome in preclinical stage. So, of course, we have seen, given that fact, we have seen a lot of orphan drug designations. And of course, we will see some more in the Usher space and in the retina space. And unfortunately, we have already seen some orphan drugs disappear from pipelines. And we have seen some clinical trials being terminated prematurely. In the case of Usher syndrome, there was one for Usher syndrome subtype 1B, the one in my family, which was prematurely terminated some years ago. And more recently, we have seen uh, some premature termination. So you'll be aware, Dominique, of course, that the European Commission recently published their proposals to revise the legislation around orphan medicines. Do you think that if lots of the legislative revisions that are being proposed had had they been in place earlier, do you think they would have basically led to improved treatments and, and care for your daughter throughout her life? Well, definitely. <laughs> but so when we look into these questions, maybe we'd have to ask ourselves and maybe we should ask those working on that regulation. What is the ultimate goal or what is the purpose of an OMP regulation or of an improved OMP regulation? So what makes an improved OMP regulation successful or more successful? And how can we define or redefine that success? and what is it about. When I discuss this with families, some of them ask me, what is that regulation about or that whole discussion? Is it about shareholder value or is it just about Europe's competitiveness? 
or is it more about Europe being a good place for patients with a rare disease such as Usher syndrome and for their families? Is it a good place to live, a place where research and development of treatments are centered around patients' unmet medical needs? Is Europe a place where patients are seen as equal partners during the whole cycle of drug development? Is Europe a place where we have timely and equal access to treatments because the clinical trials found innovative therapies cross the finish line and are later also available and accessible to patients in need, regardless in which part of the European Union they live. So these are other questions that we would have to address. And well, I've seen a lot of patients and families living with Usher syndrome or similar eye conditions. All those people, they have given their input to preference surveys or to discussions or workshops and the results, well, those people, the, the results of those discussions, they have one thing in common. The most important thing they all want is a treatment and not any treatment, but a treatment that, that is meaningful to them. In the proposal, the proposal talks about a meaningful reduction in disease morbidity or mortality. And I'm asking myself, who will define what meaningful is? Is it the developer, the patients, and also meaningful for whom? And who will define which medical conditions may be seen as significantly debilitating, which is also a wording that is in that uh, proposal currently. Thanks, Dominique. You've highlighted some really important areas there about the sort of the goals of the European Commission's proposed revisions. Simone, are the points listed by Dominique, are they reflected in the views of Europe's broader rare disease community? Of course, they are shared, particularly by the entire community. As you know, if we look at what is the stated problem, it's in terms of fulfilling and met therapeutic needs, even if at cost of simplifying what the community needs is more treatment for more diseases and better treatment for the existing diseases to the point of being transformative. And they can only be transformative if they are meaningful for the patient. And that is exactly what it should be and we should advocate it for. Now, the good part of this proposal that we are now seeing, and just as a way of introducing it, the regulation of an orphan medicinal product is part of what is called a pharmaceutical package, which in the intention of the commission revamps the rules of, on pharmaceutical across Europe, but it retains that equity principle that we talked about at the beginning. And that is a very good start. It also does not throw the baby out with the bathwater because it builds upon uh, some of the successful initiatives that uh, have been uh, taking place in Europe in the last 20 years. However, if we look at how Dominic has framed the conversation, we need to see whether patient voice is addressed. And if we start with one of the main features newly introduced, such as the, un the concept of unmet medical need already in the regulation, the question of terminology, particularly around what recognizes a meaningful reduction, what is the question of mortality and mobility in which part of the population, they need to be decided in cooperation with all of the stakeholders involved, including payers, regulators, of course, HTA bodies, patient sponsors, and clinicians. However, when we look into the proposal, unfortunately, this process shall include payers and HTA bodies. It may include patients and others, and that is not good enough. Also, because it is evidence that the inclusion of patients leads to better clinical development and better treatment at the other day with a higher chance of being authorized. This is very important to us. And I think this is the key question that we need to ask. If we want to have treatment that are good for the patients and good for society, we need to focus on the patient needs. And that should be our guiding way. Secondly, I think we need to address the question of competitiveness and the role of Europe as a leading line in research in rare diseases. We need to understand that we're not building it anymore into as we were in 2000, where we were looking at really trying to direct investment in those areas. We're now building upon 20, over 20 years of experience, over 20 years of research-based projects that have created an infrastructure that is definitely not what it was 20 years ago. 
but also we should decide as a community of Europeans where we want to go. With this proposal, which should be part of the overall, let's say, life science strategy of Europe, we need to bring together all of the different parts of the ecosystem. Are we funding research enough? in Europe? Are we supporting the clinical infrastructure? Are we involving the patient in all of the decisions that are taking place? This proposal does touch upon some of these areas. We would have liked it to be more courageous in creating what is called a single market for pharmaceuticals. And potentially there is scope within the regulation to, for example, in the areas that are deemed to be of exceptional therapeutic value, near again, it's a question of terminology, who and what decides upon what is exceptional therapeutic value. Those therapies, for example, should be granted a preferential or a preferred European pathway, particularly because one, they are of uh, exceptional or should be of excellent public health value. Two, they will transform the life of the patient. And three, the when it comes to the scale that is needed to make those therapies both affordable and available and accessible, we need to look at the European scale. So in essence, we still are looking for to improve this uh, proposal. There are a number of features that we believe will make a good dent into the new tech therapies and supporting development of therapies for rare diseases. However, we need to be careful on the language and how do we structure the process and to make sure that it corresponds to patient need. It's no surprise that those views of Dominique's are reflected across the community. Simone, so you've outlined some areas where the proposals can be improved, especially with regard to making sure that patient representatives are incorporated into medicine's development right from the start, right to the end. And you've, of course, mentioned the potential of making Europe a sort of world leader in this area, building on what's been achieved over the past more than 20 years. Could you actually maybe, in quite concrete, specific terms, outline a number of the measures that your audience is calling for? Like, what very specific things do we want to see updated in the Commission's proposals? Certainly, particularly when it comes to the definition of unmet medical needs and what is introduced in the proposal, in proposed regulation, the high unmet medical needs. Whilst we agree and we have called for this modulation approach, we still believe, as I said before, that patients should be included much more. And certainly the definition of patient engagement should be included much more strongly already in the regulation. We welcome the fact that four patient representatives and their alternates have been included in the Committee of Human Medicinal Product, which ultimately provides the definitive opinion on the medicine authorization. However, we need to have more guarantee on that front. Secondly, I talk about a modulation of incentives in order to take stock of the understanding of the diseases, et cetera, et cetera, but also to modulate the different incentives to try to direct more investment in the areas that need it the most, whilst at the same time maintaining a good enough and a competitive level of protection to ensure that in those disease areas where there are treatment, but maybe are only symptomatic treatments, research can continue. Thirdly, we we look at integrating into the regulation or, or certainly in the procedure uh, an orphan drug development plan. In particular, we see already in the proposal some spaces for that, although it's not included as we wished in the regulation, ways to strengthen the development of co-creation of a development pathway between regulators and sponsors uh, as compared to what is now to have a much more flexible ways of working, discuss issues when they arise, and really improve the success rate for treatments. And on the issues of incentives and including and making sure that Europe remain competitive, we suggested the introduction of an additional year of potential market exclusivity for sponsors that choose Europe as a first constituency of launch, if you wish. In, in, in this case, that would, we think, uh, signal a real openness of Europe for investment in research and development for rare diseases. One of the things that we also called is the introduction of the codification of the priority medicine scheme in the regulation, which we have seen has worked to bring even the therapies that mentioned by Dominique before on ATMP specifically to market, and that is now codified in the legislation, but we would like to see even more include. Last but not least is the question around creating this pathway from regulation to access as an incentive as well. So for those conditions that are very rare or uh, that are addressed by complex therapies, creating a single European pathway through 
through a common authorization, through a common HD assessment, through common negotiation and procurement would really help in solidifying Europe as a health system or a market, if you wish, and also can provide access to therapy much more quickly in this situation. So obviously there are all these areas where the proposals can be updated and improved. What exactly happens next with the proposals that the Commission have launched? What kind of timeline are we looking at? What exactly happens next? So in theory, this goes through the classic ordinary legislative procedure and therefore both elected representative of Europeans and members of the European Parliament will have now an opportunity to scrutinize the, the package and those that will lead this work have started to be appointed. However, we have a European election looming next year and therefore we probably can expect from the European Parliament a lot of work between now and March, April next year. This this represents a, both a challenge and an opportunity. Yes, we can have a, a quick review of these rules, but at the same time, member states need to scrutinize it. And let's not forget, there are another number of legislative proposals, not necessarily related to health, that need to be discussed. So the, really, the window of opportunity is wise. Member states will take their time. And I don't think that taking all of this in consideration, the European election, changing the European Commission, and the heftiness, if you wish, of this proposal, I don't think we will see a conclusion of the negotiation before 2025. Well, at least hopefully that means there'll be ever more opportunities for actually influencing what's proposed, especially as we move into the European parliamentary elections. Dominique, based on what you've heard and based on what your reflections on the recently launched proposals, does the direction of legislative change in this area, does it fill your family with hope? How do you feel about what's being proposed in the direction of travel? Well, hope, yes. Hope is maybe, well, it's more a feeling. So I'm more the person who believes in, let's say, realistic scenarios for the future. So when I listen to Simone, <laughs> I'm very positive. I really appreciate the way you are so much into the detailed information and how to strengthen the orphan drug development process and how to make Europe more competitive and a better place for patients with rare diseases. But I'd also say that to have a positive view on the future scenario, we really have to look after the implementation of what we have been discussing so far. And if you ask me what I find most important or what the main messages to be addressed would be, we have heard a lot of them now, but I'd like to add an aspect that is more from the patient perspective, or maybe I should say from the EU citizens perspective. So as I have mentioned before in the ASHA space and in the wider retina space, I've seen orphan drugs disappear from pipelines for various reasons, which sometimes we know and sometimes we don't. So this was partly due to scientific redirection or to in and out licensing changes and also the premature stop of clinical trials. In some cases, we didn't see any results published. So some of them didn't meet the endpoints, although patients have reported them as effective. But the clinical trial wasn't a success because it was the clinical significance wasn't enough. And then it was terminated. So from the patient or the EU citizen's perspective, I have to say I'd like to see a regulation that makes sure that all the time and the funds invested into drug development for a certain disease or a specific mutation. I mean, we are talking about public money, about taxpayers' money. We are talking about funds raised by patient organizations or by foundations, etc. So I'd like to see this regulation give an answer to the question how we can make sure that developers bring experimental treatments across the finish line. We are talking a lot about incentives, also more regulated incentives, not a bad idea, but to be honest, I'd also like to see some obligations. So how can we make sure that not only about, I think it's 10% or something of those experimental treatments make it to approval and when they make it, how do we make them available and accessible as Simone also has a very well outlined before, because we cannot see that regulation in isolation. It's part of a bigger puzzle. 
And also we have to talk about and to look into accessibility or let's say sustainability and affordability in the long run for healthcare systems. And yes, of course, while it's it's hard to imagine that any sort of revisions would eradicate disappointments when it comes to the development of drugs, they should also, of course, be minimised, especially when so many people living with a rare disease across Europe don't have any form of treatment or only have, of course, symptomatic treatment for their condition. So, of course, any disappointments in what begins being developed should be minimised without, of course, compromising the science. Simone, what would be your elevator pitch to MEPs and member states whose opportunity now exists to modernise Europe's system for incentivizing new rare disease medicines? Because it matters. It matters to people, Dominic, who are experiencing in first hand what a European commitment to solidarity and equity would mean by incentivizing those therapies for the people that need it the most, while at the same time thinking long term, how can we ensure that Europe remains at the forefront of innovation and takes care of people living with rare diseases, not only Europe, but beyond our borders. It really matters. I mean, this is one of the pieces of legislation that can have an impact on everyday life of citizens of Europe and really beyond, because once a therapy is invented Europe, we do tend to have a great degree of solidarity with everyone else because we don't want to leave no one behind. Dominique, I may ask you the same question, actually. What would be your elevator pitch to MEPs and member states and perhaps also just the European public as they uh, take to the voting stations next year? Well, it's very much a matter of how we see patients. Do we see patients as just as end consumers of a medicinal product, like for instance, for a TV set? And I am sure that for a TV set, they do a lot of surveys before they produce it amongst consumers. Uh, Do we see them as equal partners and recruit them in the whole cycle of research and development and also in all those discussions? And do we want an OMP regulation that is at the service of developers, at the service of regulators, of payers, of health authorities, at the service of EU citizens at the service of patients. And I guess we want to tick all those boxes. And maybe one more thing, we talk about a legislation of products, but at the end of the day, isn't it a legislation for people, for patients, for children? And shouldn't this be reflected not only in the wording, but also in the outcomes of an improved legislation. And I'm really asking how many treatments will we see or from how many rare diseases will we see new treatments approved in, let's say, five or seven years from now, so in 2030, for 50, for some hundred, for 1,000? And will I or will the Asha community see a treatment for at least one Asha subtype? Will we see that? Absolutely. No, that's so important. And given there are so many sort of rare diseases that go totally untreated, it's so important that, of course, Europe's regulations around encouraging more rare disease medicines development are improved so that the scientific developments that we've also covered in today's discussion are also embraced and that Europe doesn't fall too far behind. Simone, Dominique, thank you so much for joining me and sharing your expertise and experiences today. Thank you, Julian, for hosting. Thank you. You have been listening to Rare On Air, a Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe podcast with me, Julian Poulan. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe so you can tune in next month to learn more about the world of rare diseases. Do you have any reflections from today's episode that you would like to share? Feel free to email us at rareonair at We look forward to you joining us next month.